I am very happy to offer you an introductory level of discussion of the basis and backwardation in gold and silver. His, here is Rudy Fritsch. Please welcome him. He's Well, I'd like to introduce myself in a couple of words, Rudi Fritsch. Uh, I'm also Hungarian descent, and I left Hungary in '56 along, not along with the professor, but at the same time. There's a bit of a bio in my handout if you're interested. I don't want to spend too much time on this. As far as putting the expert first, this is okay. It's People okay. say, wow, there's a lot of depth here. Let's dig down there and find it. Uh. So I want to start digging. I was going to start by asking, are there any traders in the house? Well, I'm going to ask, are there any non-traders in the house? So there are people who may not understand all these terms, and that's fine. Um, basis, contango, backwardation, these are technical terms as they pertain to the futures markets. But there is a connection there. Everything is, is connected. And there's important ramifications to the real world reality economic realities. <clears throat> so in order to understand basis contango and bad predation, we have to understand the futures markets, what they do and where they come from. So we're going to go back in history a little bit before there were futures markets and look at why they started. They are emergent phenomena. These markets arose out of a need in the marketplace. And they started in the grains market, farmers markets. And the need was very simple. You all understand Farming is a pretty risky business. You, you take your chance, you plant your seed, you plow the fields, and then you kind of hope that the rains come at the right time, the right amount of rain, and so on, to bring your crop in, and the locusts don't come and eat all your stuff. And another risk is the market risk. When your crop is in, what will you, pay, what will you get paid for this? So are you going to make money or lose money? And if the prices are high in October, November, the farmer is going to make excess profits or more profits. But if they're low, he's going to lose. Now, the excess profits are nice, but losing is deadly. They might lose the farm. They might go bankrupt. So they want to minimize their market risk. And they did. Historically, there's a thing called forward sales, where a farmer would, in June or whenever uh, planting time comes up, sell his crop for delivery in October, November, December. There was no crop. There, was no, there were no grains. There was only a potential, a hope, an expectation, an estimate. Yes, I think I'm going to grow a thousand bushels or whatever, so I'm going to try to sell it now. It's a promise to deliver then. Now, the other side of this, the buyer of grains is maybe a big flour mill, uh, General Foods, who make cereals. <coughs> animal fodder, whatever, big companies, they need grains. And of course, their purpose is to buy grain at, at a good price, a lower price. The farmer wants a higher price. So in the price area, they're sort of competing. But in the fact that they want to reduce their risks, they're on the same page. Mm -hmm. the, the buyer of the grain doesn't want to take risks. They have a budget. They have enough, some capital to invest in this grain. They don't want to end up paying more and being in financial problems. Of course, if they end up paying less, that would be fine. They're also willing to give up this excess profit in order to get rid of risk. So they go out and they agree to buy from the farmer early. Now think about it. There are thousands of farmers and hundreds or maybe thousands of buyers. Every farmer has to find a buyer for his grain and every mill has to find a supplier. So they're kind of looking for each other. And then they negotiate, every contract individual. And then they sign the contracts, and either lawyers involved, cost money, cost time. And there's a risk. What if the farmer doesn't meet his quota? Well, suddenly it's going to be shortchanged. Or what if the, the buyer goes bankrupt? The farmer's got a problem. So they may have to insure their contracts. So there's a lot of stuff in there. This is almost like barter. You have to find the right person on the opposite side to take your stuff. There was a need to standardize this. And this is where the futures or commodity exchanges first came about. They decided to standardize the contracts, standardize the dates, and take, take on this whole thing so that every farmer would not have to deal with a thousand buyers, just with one buyer. They could sell their grain 
through the services of the grain exchange. On the other side, all the buyers of it could buy it from the same grain exchange. So it made this transaction a lot easier. Standardized contracts, pre-written, no need for lawyers, uh, and the risk is dissipated. The, the commodity house, the exchange takes on the risk, and if one farmer defaults or if one buyer defaults, the house covers this. It's not a problem. Of course, there's too many oh, different story. <coughs> so, this was an improvement, but there's still one component missing to make this really work smoothly. For example, if it's early in the spring and all the farmers are busy selling the contract, selling the contract, prices start to go down. A lot of selling, not balanced by buying. And contrary-wise, maybe later on in the year, there are a lot of buyers, not enough sellers, so the prices to go up. There's a lot of volatility and a mismatch. You understand every contract for grain or for whatever commodity, for every buyer, there's a seller, and it's one-on-one. -on -one. And the commodity house does not own contracts. It's, it strictly transacts. There must be, a, outside of the commodity house, a buyer and a seller for every contract. So every farmer who sells a contract, or whoever, there must be one who buys that contract, takes the other side of the trade. So this opening is where the speculators come in. Now speculator today is kind of a dirty word. Oh, speculators, they cause problems. Well, originally, no, they did not cause problems. They brought liquidity to the market. And their approach, they're not a buyer or a seller per se. They're not going to deliver wheat or take delivery of wheat. They're only looking at making a profit. And how do they make a profit? By looking at the market, studying the price trends. Uh, you know, the Chinese people are richer today and they're eating more pigs, so there's many more corn sales, so prices should go up. And they take on the risk. They buy these contracts when they think the prices are too low. They sell them when they think they're too high. And that brings liquidity to the market and it makes the whole thing work. So we've got these markets. Now, if you look at the contracts, first of all, like I said, one-on-one -on -one for every contract, there's a short and a long, or a seller and a buyer. And there's also a term structure in time. In other words, let's say a grain contract calls for 100 bushels of wheat, you know, hard red winter wheat, or soft <coughs> Kansas City wheat, whatever, it doesn't matter. And for delivery in, July or September or October, different months. So there's a time structure of these contracts. So if someone goes out and buys corn, you don't just buy corn, you buy a certain month, and then you buy a certain quantity, a number of contracts, one by one. And in order to buy it or to sell it, you make a de small deposit called a margin, which is a good faith deposit. And of course, the margin is set by the house to cover their risk. And if they see volatility and problems, the margin might go up but it's typically, typically pretty small. So you've got this term structure in, in these contracts, and then, of course, there's the cash price. Now, cash price is where you, you phone the granary and say, my truck's on the way, what's the price now? I want, a, you know, a thousand bushels of Kansas City wheat. Oh, so many dollars per bushel, that's it. The future prices are for delivery in the future. Now already, somebody, trust, uh, somebody talked about the carry charge. And this is where the future prices start to diverge from the cash prices. In, in, let's think about it this way. If you, you want to use wheat in December, but you buy it today, what are you going to do with it till then? Now you're going to have to put it in a warehouse or a bin, insure it, pay for it, keep it up, etc., etc. So that's costing money, and that's the carry charge. So the normal shape of the futures term structure is a slope upwards. And that is what we call contango, for some reason. If you look it up in Wikipedia, there's a historical reason where contango comes from. I don't want to touch that. Now the basis is, you know the word basis, it means the basis of comparison. If you say I'm going to build a bridge 100 feet above about what? Well, ground level or average sea level or something. There's some basis. And the basis actually is the cash basis. So you're comparing the futures price to the cash price now. Now the other interesting thing is that the, future, the futures roll around, they come around. I mean, if today is March, June is a futures contract. 
But by the time we're in June, that is now that the cash price moves up to that date. So if this is clear, and if it's not, please stop me. I, I don't mind. I'd like to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about. You, if you sell uh, for delivery your grain today, you lock in that price, and when the contract comes due, you deliver your grain. Done. If you want to take delivery of grain, you buy it on that date, that futures contract when it comes due, you take your, your grain and you pay the price that you bought it for when you initiated the contract. And this is what the farmers and the commercials do theoretically. Now the speculators never do that. They don't want to end up with a truckload of grain, and they don't have a truckload of grain. So if they sell grain, they don't have anything to deliver. And if they buy grain, they're not going to take delivery. What they do is close their contract before it comes due. In other words, if they, if they sold, they buy it back, and if they bought, they sell it back. And then the cash that they make or lose is the difference from when they lock it in to the current price, which is uh, the current futures price. Is that okay, everybody? Follow that? All right. So, the need for speculative money. Um, now, the structure of the markets is interesting, and if we've, I've got a few uh, charts in there that show cash versus futures. Uh, I just took some closing prices uh, from the internet. And if you want to take a peek at that, you see there's a tendency for an upward slope, and you look at the cash price, and you look at the, uh, the, the futures price, and every month or every several months there's a futures contract. In, and every commodity has a different structure. Some of them are monthly, some of them are bi-monthly, some of them every quarter, depends what they are. It doesn't really matter to the principle of it. <coughs> Now, the cash price is determined by current demand and supply, right? If, there are more, if there's more stuff available, then the buyers are eager to buy, they're not so eager to buy, then the price goes down. If there are a lot of buyers who are eager to buy, not as many sellers, the price goes up. This is what drives the market price, cash prices. Future prices are another thing, they depend on expectations and whatnot. Never mind that right now. The main point is, if there is a contango, which is a normal state, the normal contango is the carry charge. So if you carry it for a month, you pay X dollars, two months, two X dollars, three months, three X dollars, whatever the warehousing costs and the interest costs are. Now for some reason, and it may be a glut or it may be a drop in demand, the cash price starts to go down. Well, unless the future prices follow, there's a change. The basis changes. The, the comparison of the cash price to the future price, you subtract one from the other, it gets bigger. And bigger. And at some point, it's kind of like you can buy crude oil for $50 a barrel and store it for three months for a dollar a barrel and then sell it for $55 a barrel. Risk-free profit, arbitrage. That's the word we use to describe, these are not speculators who will do the arbitrage. They're looking, speculators are looking for large profits for a risk. Arbitrageur is looking for modest profits, but no risk. So, they go out and buy oil, and this happened not too long ago, as I'm sure most of you know. Rent a super tanker to store it in for three months, deliver it into the futures contract. So you buy the cash at 50, you sell at 55 and you pay two bucks for storage, three dollars per barrel, clear profit, risk-free unless the super tanker sinks in a hurricane. <laughs> and the, the fact that it's risk-free is because you own the commodity. The buyer, the arbitrator has it, there it is, price is locked in and when the time comes, delivers it. He's not open to any changes or swings in the market. Is that clear? Yes, sure? Yeah. Okay. So, if the contango gets too big, arbitrage starts to pick up steam, and it, there's, it becomes more and more profitable. If there's a huge contango, or the futures are really, really expensive, it's incredibly profitable, and many people do it. Shell did it. Uh, people, anybody who's got a few million bucks, either money or good credit, 
can do it. And they just hire somebody to store the stuff, they don't store it in their backyard, and they make their money. So let's flip this around and look at backwardation. Now backwardation is a condition whereby the current price, the cash price, is higher than the futures price, or at least the, uh, the future price which you include the carry cost. So think about this, you can have a higher cash price and a lower futures price. Now what would cause this to happen? Well, the higher cash price means there's a lot of demand for this stuff, not enough supply. So, is the same arbitrage possible? Well, there's a, a lack of something, you can't buy it, you need to sell it, the cash product. How can you sell it? Anybody have a tanker full of oil ready to sell? Or a bin full of grain? No. Those people who own the stuff are already behind the eight ball, they're having a problem delivering it, which is what drove the backwardation in the first place. That's what drove up the cash price. A lot of demand, not enough supply. So you can't have this kind of thing. There's not enough stock around to do it. You can have a, a, an arbitrage take care of a, a growing pentangle, but if it shrinks the other way, there's no real arbitrage opportunity. You'd have to speculate. So you understand the difference? You'd have to buy and sell in the futures market itself. You cannot speculate or rather arbitrage with the cash commodity. Now I'm talking about your average commodity, that is for consumption, uh, grains, foodstuffs, these are all used up, they, they come into the warehouse and then they go out. The stocks of these commodities are very low. For example, a carry out in grains is a matter of a few months of supply, enough to go to the next harvest and maybe a bit more, not much more. Uh, in, in oil, uh, the U.S. Strategic Reserve has 90 or 120 days worth of supply in it, all of it. So if the, if the supply of oil were to be cut off, within 90 days or 120 days, there would be no more oil. Well, that's, pretty, that's pretty open to swings and changes and so on. <coughs> now on the other hand, we'll look at the silver and, metal, uh, silver and gold, which are a different kind of commodity. These are not for consumption, they're not food, they're not fuel, they're something else, they're money. And the thing is that versus copper, for example, which is not <coughs> metal, which has about 30 days of stock versus uh, mine supply and total supply. In other words, if you cut off all the supply of copper today, within 30 days there will be no more copper around. Maybe a little bit more in China. But we're talking a matter of days. In gold and silver, and I happen to know the numbers for gold, there are 80 years worth of supply available above ground. 80 years versus 30 days. Now think about this. How could there be a shortage in gold, or similarly in silver? You know, somebody was kind enough to give me some numbers for silver as well, but the principle is the same. There's tremendous, tremendous amounts of this stuff around. And so anybody could do the backwardation arbitrage. In other words, sell the cash, buy the future, lock in the profit. Is that okay? Everybody understand that? Yeah. If the cash price today is higher than the future price today, today you pick up two phones, one in this hand, one in the other, <laughs> buy this, sell that, well, at the same time, almost simultaneously as possible, lock in your profit, send out your gold, and in 30 days, 90 days, it comes back to you. Maybe. Maybe. And of course, that's the key. That's the very key. The ramification of this stock to flow ratio means there cannot really be a backwardation caused by a shortage. There is no shortage. There's 80 years worth of stuff lying around, either on people's necks, or in their hip pockets, or a little hole in the backyard, or in a central banker's vault. So when and if there is a shortage, it's not, uh, or a backwardation, it's not driven by physical shortage, it's driven by psychological shortage. Will I sell my gold and hope to get it back? Do I have the confidence or the faith in the system? And the answer is, in the numbers, if there is a backwardation, significant backwardation, and it's not being arbitraged out, it's because people no longer believe that the arbitrage will work. That is, they're afraid of the risk. And that's basically it, that's the whole point. So if you are not a trader, or you're not going to make profit in the commodity markets, 
Nevertheless, keeping an eye on this is important because as we discussed over here, this is um, the last arbitrage is going to lose his gold. And you don't want to be that. And also, if, even if you don't do the arbitrage, you have to be aware that something is happening with the monetary system. Gold is going to be locked away. And, um, you know, it's a short squeeze in gold, I guess, is what the professor would call it. Nobody wants to sell, sell their gold at any price because this backwardation can go to the moon. So, hopefully, I uh, made this clear to you guys. Any questions? It's right. Was that a question? Yeah, no, I was just like, no? it's right. Okay. That is phases contained on back to the beginner's level. When you have the backwardation. I'm sorry, go ahead. When you have the backwardation. Yes. Somebody is willing to sell your gold future at a lower price than today. And that, in principle, is anathema to economic uncertainty. Because if you have a high degree of economic uncertainty, you shouldn't have people willing to take the risk to sell something out in the future uh, when they don't know where it will stand. Well, in a backwardation, you're selling the cash and buying the future. So you're taking your gold or right. whatever, you're, selling, you're selling it because the cash price is higher, and right. three months in the future, you buy back the same gold. You have bought back the same gold by signing the contract at a lower price. Right. Done. The higher the economic uncertainty is, uh, the higher your risk that you either won't be able to buy it back in the future or you won't get it delivered. So well, the, I'm the sorry. degradation doesn't seem to make sense in a time of very high economic uncertainty. Okay, I, the, the first part of what you said, no, you, it's not a question of buying it back. You already bought it back. You've got a contract that says, I am going to pick up my gold for this price on that date when the contract matures. It's done. It's locked in. It's in the system. <clears throat> the only thing is the second part that will not be delivered to you if the system collapses, if, then you will not get your gold back. And who knows what's going to happen. They may put allocations on. They may... Uh, cash settlement, which is very likely. Uh, the LME, the London Metal Exchange, has already had some of these instances. And so you will get back paper for your gold. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to take that risk? That's why. And of course, the more uncertain the economic situation, the more iffy this becomes. And that is an indication of the backward. That is the cause of the backwardation, I should say. There is a backwardation because people don't believe they get their gold back and they don't do this trade. But there's two parties to the trade. So somebody is also selling the future at a lower price. Mm -hmm. Rudy, I'd like to answer, add something here. Sure, by all means, please. This is a very interesting situation. As you see, as we move into economic uncertainty, why is somebody selling their gold anyway? That's what you're asking. And it, it may appear to defy logic, but it doesn't when you understand where the logic is coming from. The gold they're selling is not their own. If I were selling my gold, I would be taking the risk. If I were selling somebody else's gold, I would not be. All right? And this is where the answer lies. For the, for the past de few decades, um, the gold market has been a very interesting place. Mine gold supplies approximately 60% of the demand into the market. I like to use the analogy if we had a grain market where the demand for grain was 60%. I want to tell you, if the demand for grain was met by harvest of only 60%, very few people in this room would be eating bread at the level they are. It would be driven through the roof. The price of, 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 of pasta, the price, the price of bread, would be skyrocket until it reached a certain level of where the market adjusted itself. But we're not talking about bread. We're talking about the most precious metal on earth, gold. And it's in a situation where the mine, where the mine gold coming out of the market is unable and has been unable for decades to meet the demand. It's a 60%. Where has that demand been made up it's been made up by the sale of central bank gold. 
Now I want to make a point if it's it's all right Absolutely. with you, Freddie. Sure. Really. Is that the reason why they're doing this is very easy. The people selling the gold, it's not their gold they're selling. It's the investment banks selling, forward selling, sometimes leasing the gold of their countries, of their central banks, into the market. Now, if it were Mr. Gordon Brown's gold in 1999 when he stole 415 tons of London's gold, announced selling 415 tons of London's gold, England's gold into the market, if it was the Brown family's stash of gold, I think he would have been garroted by the aunts and uncles and grandfathers and perhaps the fathers of the children because he would be selling their patrimony to be gone, converted into cash at a loss, which it was. But he didn't sell the Brown family's gold. He sold the gold that belonged, quote unquote, to the people of England. He sold their gold. And this is the gold that's been coming onto the market constantly, year after year, keeping that price down. All right? The paper gold. The paper gold. <coughs> Selling it down, which converted into real gold, though. They would sell it forward, they'd sell it on, you know, on, on the con that they're going to pay it back. But it was real bullion that was sold into the market that suppressed the price of gold. So your question is very, very good, and it speaks to the point. Why would anybody sell their gold in a time of economic uncertainty? Well, they've been selling that gold for over 20 to 30 years in times of not economic uncertainty to keep the price low. As the uncertainty rises, they've still done it. In the run-up to gold that's happening now, and this is, you've got to realize that gold is the thermometer of economic uncertainty, the only one that exists, all right? In the rise of gold, when gold made its move from 680 or 640 up to 1,000 a year and a half ago, when it made its move, its quick move, and I think we all remember that in this room, all right? It made its move from that low point, it started speeding up. Um. I think another way of putting this is that backwardation is a bribe for suckers. It's true. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. yeah. At the moment, we discuss it very academically, which is not bad at all. But shouldn't we consider to get a proof on this discussion here? We need to distinguish between commercial backwardation. So that arbitrage to happen, the degradation must reach a certain level. And what we have seen from the excellent study uh, before, that it was never commercial just to deliver physical coal into commerce would cost you more than 0.4, much more than 2.4. If a situation arises that the degradation becomes reasonable commercial, let's say 10, 20 percent, then it's the, the proof of concept, let's say, if not someone really has a goal, shipping it into it, making the profit, and making sure that these guys will have the power to get the common score and also output, which is a the process, but everyone can do it, also we should do that. And at the moment we see degradation, but to my opinion, we don't see commercial degradation in the gold that's arbitrage really could on a commercial level set in. Okay, I'd like to answer that. Uh, I put a little chart here <coughs> showing the price and the time, and these are, for example, monthly or bi-monthly, whatever, various contracts coming in to effect. Everybody can see that? Now, this is your cash price right here, your spot price. Okay? And, of course, if it's X dollars, you can draw a straight line across, that's the cash price. And you look at the first, the nearby future, there's a little difference in here between the spot price and the first month, or the nearby, this is the basis, okay? and uh, the cash basis. Now you can look at this one and say, well, this is the second, second basis, and so on. Now if this slope is equal to the carry charge, you really don't have a, you have a standard contango one. There's no incentive to do any trading whatsoever. If this starts to rise a little bit steeper, like this, let's say, from the cash, the contango is going out, it's getting bigger. Now, <clears throat> it's bidding for storage. In other words, it might make sense to do, buy the cash, sell the future, because this is what it costs to carry, and this is profit, right? 
from the straightforward arbitrage. <coughs> now, if you go the other way, and theoretically or technically, if your future price structure is lower than the carry charge, you are at the beginning of bad position. And this is already a profit. You think about it. That's the warehouse profit. You make the profit the warehouse that I would make by keeping it. And of course, really, if it gets down here, then this profit is a lot bigger, and now it's profitable even according or, or versus or basis the cash price. And yeah, I mean, uh, that's true. There has to be enough back to justify the trade, and questions, and that's where all the technicalities come in, uh, the bid versus the offer, and which bid and which offer, and so on. I'll leave that to the experts. I, I just want to look at the ramifications on the global picture. If my costs to do it are slower, some may will do it. If if I don't do it, I want to see why aren't the pros doing it? Why aren't they doing this? Why are Switzerland really very practical? Take the Switzerland ball and try to do this uh, this exchange. If I get 20 percent on the gold price even now, it makes sense. I think Nathan's going to do that. He's going to do the advanced class. It will simply not happen, most likely never, is it? Because I'll, 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 I'll leave that for get off the track. He's going to talk. Okay, we have another question. Yeah, I, uh, I have a real problem with making decisions without having real, honest to goodness, uh, good information. Like, for instance, who could tell me how much gold is stored in Fort Knox? Maybe it's completely empty. On the other hand, when, when these two <laughs> trade centers collapsed, uh, you know, it's just. Accidentally, you read in the newspaper that there were enormous amounts of gold bricks stored in the sub basement somewhere, which belongs to somebody. And there's a lot of things that I personally don't know. And to make a decision based on no knowledge is very precarious. Well, you're, I think what you are looking for is you have all these factors, this credit. I mean, there's a root here, there's branches and branches and twigs and twigs. No end to it. But this basis subsumes all these little bitty pieces and factors, and it shows up in the grand total of this basis. Because if it was gold was lost, or found, or whatever, whatever shows up in the prices. Technically, this by itself is enough to trade on. Do you agree with that? See? And he's made some nice profit. Just looking at this, he doesn't care about the, the tower, or the stories, or rumors, or whatever. He looks at these numbers, studies them in depth, and he focuses on it. Now, that's not my purpose here. My purpose is to project this out to why a gold standard? Why? Because there's 80 years of gold out there. Think about it. For any other commodity to compete with gold, it would have to be accumulated for 80 years from now. And in 80 years, gold will have increased to maybe 160 years. So no other commodity can even catch gold like silver comes close. There's an infinite supply of paper, Mr. Fridge. That's correct. And ink. <clears throat> Absolutely. <laughs> Just add another zero. <clears throat> How about platinum and palladium? Yes, very good question. These are precious metals and diamonds, for example. These are super stores of wealth, but they're not money. They're not fungible. And as far as diamonds are concerned, platinum, palladium, and so on, are precious metals, but there is not 80 years of supply above. Now think about it, if the supply is cut off totally, so what? There's not going to be a shortage, there's 80 years worth sitting around. Just people have to start putting it into circulation. They decide to take off their gold necklace, turn it into coins, turn it into money. It's easy. With, with uh, platinum, palladium, all the other precious metals, they don't have this specific quality. And why does gold have 80 years worth of supply? It doesn't, doesn't make any sense just because it's nice and pretty and bends. No, it's because gold has been money, is money, continues to be money. The reason it is money is because there are 80 years of supply, and there are 80 years of supply because it is money, and people hoard it. Um, if I could introduce another economic concept, diminishing marginal utility, as the professor talked about. If you're dying of thirst on the Sahara Desert, the first liter of water offered to you is worth life itself. It's beyond price. And the second is pretty close. And the third. By the time you get to the fourth liter, ooh, I need a canteen to carry this. 
So your priority for uh, the water has changed in your, in your thinking. And after 22 liters, <laughs> I need a camel to carry all this water. And it's changed again. But think about it, if you're using gold or silver, first you can use the gold and silver to buy water, then you can use the gold or silver to buy tankings, then you can use the gold and silver to buy a camel. So all your highest priorities are met by money. So the, the marginal utility does not decline. And that's why people accumulate endless gold and silver. Because they can use it for whatever. Yeah, how is the eight years calculated? It's eight. calculated by the, there's 162,000 metric tons of gold above ground accounted for, including jewelry, bullion, whatever, and, 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 and suddenly has some breakdown of this, versus mine supply. And every year, so many tons of the stuff is mined out, it comes to about one and a quarter percent growth in the supply per year, 80 years. Yeah, any... Uh, no, what about the stock in silver? I'm sorry? What about silver? Uh, well, uh, uh, okay, uh, this is Sunday's numbers. With silver, there's less of it in bullion and immediately available coin form according to these numbers. Uh, think about it, silver is not worn as much as adornment, close to people, it's more like silverware, stuff on the table, on the plate. Uh -huh. So if you look at the total amount, it's very close. 1.4% which is 1.7 of, of, of productivity of, the, of what's being produced, the total. So again, of the total supply in silver, 1.4% is created yearly and in gold, 1.7. And these numbers are like, who cares about the third decimal place? It's, it's 80, 80 years. Yeah, it's not 80, it's 82, or, and it's declining, so it's going to be 90, it doesn't matter. On the other hand, available quickly, uh, there's there's less of the silver, so you'd have to take your plates and silverware and so on and melt them down. But if you do melt them down, you're pretty close, according to these numbers. So and so, what would be the advantage of gold? Uh, with yes. Respect to silver as money. The, the advantage of gold is it has higher specific value. In other words, a gold coin is worth today, or you can trade it for a thousand dollars. A silver coin for fifteen dollars. So if you want to carry with you. A million dollars worth of gold versus a million dollars worth of silver, there's a huge difference. So as a means of exchange, taking uh, not wealth, but substitute for wealth or value from one place to another, gold is much more convenient, less expensive. Or portable. Portable is portable. good. Yes, thank you. The advantage of silver, on the other hand, if you want to buy a loaf of bread with a gold coin, you got a problem. But with a silver coin the size of a dime, which is maybe a tenth or a twentieth ounce of silver, yeah, it works. So it's better for small pains. Poor man's gold. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I was, I was going to say earlier, this gentleman asked about the, uh, who would ever take the, uh, uh, the opposite. opportunity where gold is in that creation. I was thinking, uh, when, I, when I was asking a, a sort of a related question, and deeper, I realized you don't necessarily, you might want to walk through the different examples because it's not necessarily the same person doing both parts of that. Yeah. If somebody's in there, it could be two people, it could be one gold bug who expects the collapse of the paper money system imminently and is buying for gold just to hold it. And on the other side, it could be the mining company hedging their production, or it could be, as Sandy was saying, a, a, a bullion bank that is uh, playing both parts of that trade, attempting to get their hands on physical gold and eating the loss as a, as a cost of doing business. Okay, David, what's the question, please, exactly? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You might want to uh, walk through uh, uh, just exactly The contango how, versus the backwardation trade? No, but what, what uh, motivates these sorts of okay. people to take that riskless profit? Well, to make a riskless profit, just anybody wants to make a riskless profit, why not? I mean, why wouldn't I want to make 10, 20% of my money at no risk? I mean, it's a no-brainer if you're aware of this situation. On the other side of it, where there is a risk, now you're speculating. It's not really arbitrary, it's speculation because what if I don't get my gold back? You say, well, the odds of me not getting my gold back are one in X, and my potential profit is one in Y, and if I can make, it's like gambling with cards. If you're, you draw to an inside straight one chance in 11 of making it, but the pot odds are, you know, 50 to 1, you go for it. And in the long term, you, you make out. 
But he see, he's pointing out in backwardation, your bet is wrong. I mean, you're just what? You're, so, no, no, I, I, no, that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Why would anybody be taking that bet at that time? They don't know they're wrong, obviously. That's what drives it. They think that they're going to get their gold back. Or maybe it's something else. I mean, this is beyond my scope, really. I don't know why. Would you do it? Well, I just feel that the logic would say that accordation should be larger in times of economic stability than in times of economic risk. Okay, well, I disagree with that, because if there's economic stability, the odds are people will take the arbitrage. They say, yeah, I'm going to sell my gold, I'll get it back, because why shouldn't I? There's no storm clouds on the horizon. You don't want to hang on to your right. and, and so that I reduces the backwardation. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. But so the backwardation goes and we show, I mean, in December, we had times of high economic uncertainty. Well, that's why the backwardation came up. Right, and that is what, in my view, doesn't make sense. I think well, that's I, so I'm trying to figure out what stands behind it. Right. Yeah, but, but it does make sense. If there's economic stability, people will take the backwardation trade with the full expectation they'll get their gold back, so it gets rid of the backwardation. Exactly. That's right. But in times of economic uncertainty, they will not take that risk because suddenly they see that there's problems out there and they're concerned they won't get their gold back. Therefore, the backwardation can grow and grow and grow. Okay, is that starting to make sense? Yeah, but you're looking at it from the party that would sell the gold to the Absolutely, you have back. to. But, but as I said before, there is a counterparty. Yes. And I'd like to know who is the counterparty and what is his motivation for the trade? To buy the gold? He at a high gold future. At a time when there is a high chance that the price is higher, and how is he covering it? I understand what you're saying. What, he's looking at the opposite side of the risk. He says, right. I think what, why are there people who sell calls and others who buy calls for the same stuff? Some people think or believe and they trade according to their beliefs that they're going to make money this way. Other people believe they're going to make money that way. The guy on the other side of the trade, ah, I'm going to get my gold back up. I'm not worried about that. So he does the trade. Well, no, what can I tell you? I, I don't read people's psychology. I'm just trying to understand how this works and what drives the market. See, in Austrian economics, called human action. Economics starts where human action takes place. When you spend your coin or you don't spend your coin, whatever, that's where economics starts. Why is psychology? Why do people take risks? Why, why do people do whatever they do? And it's interesting and you can speculate on this and it, it may be pertinent also, but it's really not economics per se. Economics is the study of what happens when people have made their decision? Why do people like apples more than oranges? And will they like apples more if the oranges cost less? Or is it the other way around? I mean, people's value scales vary and so on. I mean, the guy in the Sahara Desert has a different value scale from someone in Siberia freezing to death. The one in Siberia freezing to death will sell anything for a bunch of wood. I mean, you see? I, I would agree 100% and accept that. I think the events of maybe since October 2007 are showing us that the psychology behind people's behavior may be more relevant than economic theory. Yes, I agree. Because otherwise it would be impossible to inflate and not see any inflation. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of stuff we're seeing can only be explained by psychology and no longer by economic yes. theory. Madness of crowds. Why do people go crazy over stuff? Yes, I agree with you. That's true. Psychology is very important. <coughs> Anyone else? No? That's it? Any comments? You guys like to add something? Uh, I have a comment. Actually, the basis is only just, as you pointed out, is the basis. But there's a superstructure. Mm -hmm. Take something from nature like a cobweb, the spider's web. It's a marvelous thing. Most people have superficial thinking. They say it's there to catch the fly. But it's a lot more than that. It is a communication system. The spider lies in wait and 
any little disturbation over the cobweb will send a signal. The same way the basis is just the first step because then you can take the spread between any two future prices. There are, you know, it goes out into the future, maybe a year ahead or, lo or longer. So you can take any spread between a future date and another one. And think of it as a cobweb. So it's not just the basis, but the adjustment of the basis. We, we talked about this, right? The first derivative of the basis. Now, you have a three-dimensional image of that if you think of the cobweb. Just take this system of the spreads between various future months. It's like a surface in three dimensions, just like the cobweb is, a surface in three dimensions. And the fine little adjustments in that is a communication system. So that is what is missing, and that is the kind of research we are trying to advocate. Nobody's doing it, or if anybody's doing it, he would be keeping the carrots very close to his chest. He doesn't want you to know that he's a step ahead of you. But of course, we want to take it into the open. And this is just a wonderful thing. And thank you very much, Rudy. I think you helped us to understand this thing properly. And of course, we'll, we, are, we are looking forward to Nathan's presentation at, at shall we say, intermediate or high level. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Okay. Further questions? Well, I'd just like to add to what you said. It's a signal system. And guess what? If some thing or other squelches the signal, then things could be going on in that web that people aren't aware of. And this is where the manipulation stuff comes in. And you all know that gold is uh, the thermometer, so on and so forth. Well, the basis is also. And if these things are damaged, it's like cutting a feedback loop. If you've got an arm and a wrist and you have motion, there's a feedback loop. Your body knows where it is and how to move it. Cut the nerve. <laughs> then more feedback. And this is one of the biggest problems with today's economy. The feedback loops have been preempted and they're not there. So the signals are stifled in the price area. Now in the basis area, the signals are still pretty strong. So that's why we got to look at them. Yes, yeah, very good. Uh, actually, I'd like you to know that Sandeep is also a mathematician. He actually cut his teeth in mathematics. He wrote a thesis on minimal surfaces, which is very interesting and very relevant, because if you think of these spreads, between various future prices and in one corner is the basis being the most important because it's nearby, the others are more distant, then it's a very, very useful point of view. You have a surface in three dimensions, it's a communication system and it has an equilibrium which, at which point the area of the surface which has a fixed uh, boundary reaches its equilibrium. Uh, nature provides another fantastic tool to do this. Take a soapy solution and make up a contour of a wire and submerge that contour into that soapy solution. Pull it out, you will have a, a soapy film on, based on that particular contour. And that's fantastic because this will be a minimal surface in the sense that of the infinitely many 
surfaces which you can have based on that contour. This one, most more often than not, it's a unique surface, has minimal area. Nature has this as a gift. Now, if you want to do it on paper, or even on high-speed computers, this means solving a partial differential equation of higher order, which is an extremely complicated thing. But look, nature does it in a second. Dip your contour into the soapy solution, pull it up, bingo, right there. You've got the minimal surface. So think of it this way. I think this is very, very useful point of view. And, and uh, as I say, I'm, I'm very, very happy that we have Sandy and we are looking for, he's young, you see, <laughs> we are going out, but he's coming in and we are looking forward to the many interesting research results which will come from him. And this is not just theory, it's something practical as the application to the markets, especially the gold and silver market, is concerned. So that, that is a thought which I would like you to take with you from this conference, that uh, these theoretical considerations have very important practical applications, which presently is pretty well ignored by the community at large. Only a very few of us are thinking about this and trying to bring it into the open. Okay, um, well, still, okay, can I add something to that? I don't want you to dismiss this dipping bubble thing in us. <laughs> what the heck does it have to do with markets and whatnot? This is an emergent phenomenon literally emerging in this case. You take the sucker out of the water and it emerges and there it is, there's the solution. Well, some of these commodity markets and things that emerge out of the market are also natural phenomena and they're the right ones. Prices and uh, all these other signals, interest rates that emerge naturally from economic transactions are the right answer. And if you don't believe it, well, you've got a problem. And if you artificially try to induce, for example, you want to make that, that surface different, well, Mr. Bernanke pushes on it to make the interest rates not the minimum or not the best fit, there's a problem. And at one point, that bubble's going to burst. And that's what's happening. Another thing, you have that contour made up of a wire, and you have a soapy fill. Now, imagine that you twist the contour the surface will, of course, change, but it, at every point it will still be a minimal surface. Yes. Now, there are certain points where this becomes unstable, and these are the stationary points. But most of the time, it, is, it has a unique solution, and that's the minimal surface. So I think this is a very profitable way of looking at what is happening in the, in the uh, gold futures market. And this shows that nature provides a lot of the answers. We just have to look at nature and find the relevance. I think those of us in this room have, uh, have been lucky enough to hear the discussion of the basis far more than other people. And, uh, your, your, your explanation was not basic, it was clear. Well, clear is, yeah. I, that's why, the, you know, beginner, forget beginner, this is yeah. a Zen situation. Yes. An empty mind, an open mind, yeah. ready to accept stuff. Yeah. A master position is the beginner's mind, you know yeah. that. Yeah. That was very good, Rudy. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. My pleasure. Yeah.